Hello, welcome to Hampshire Piano. I'm Craig, and I have something interesting I'd like to share with you today. This is a very good example of a Viennese forte piano from the first decades of the 19th century. It is made by Johann Georg Graeber, and it is made in the city of Innsbruck, which I have to assume is modern-day Innsbruck. Um, it is a very good example of a piano patterned after the great maker Anton Walter, who seems to have come up with a very robust and musical design that was followed by many. And this is a fairly faithful um, homage, shall we say. Has an interesting recent history. It came up for auction out in Chicago and for some reason in the uh, in the catalog it was listed as a harpsichord and as a consequence anybody who was looking for harpsichords took one look at it and said well that's certainly not a harpsichord and went from there and anybody looking for a forte piano didn't look at it at all. So my client was quite fortunate to uh, acquire it. And I feel fortunate to uh, be able to take such a good look at it. So let's do that. The first reaction some people have to this piano has been, oh my word, it's so small. And yeah, it's 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 not uh you know piano robustus. This is a grass aisle instrument for very good reasons, but to think of it as small is misleading. It's actually seven foot nine inches long. It was 236 centimeters. And, you know, that's longer than a Model C Steinway. So, you know, this is no minor league effort. This is about as big a piano as the metallurgy of the day would allow. Wire can only be stretched so far and the string can only be made so long, and this was about the engineering limit of its day. From what I can see of Viennese forte pianos, this, while a very nice case, you know, covered in Some type of uh, blonde burl wood it has its decorations limited to a single darkened strip along the lower edge and a quarter round beading. along the edges of the uh, case parts. So this was the basic case, I think, would be the look of it. I don't think they came much plainer than this, but Call it a musician's instrument. Well, 
Electric pianos have an interesting front lid to them. There's a bit of a flip lid that exposes the keys so that it can be played. But after that, there is a second segment to the lid that can be flipped. But in order to do so, you have to re-extend that first section and get both. This system, um, this is missing here. I assume there's a music desk. In fact, I can kind of see the, the shadow of where it used to sit in the, in the wood. But that exposes um, the damper rail, literally a rail that holds the damper mechanism, and of course the tuning pin field and the strings. Either position, the lid could be raised and put on its prop. Don't believe that's the original prop, but I could be wrong. There is something to be said about every single aspect of this instrument. So I guess I will just start at the front and go through them slowly. Um, you might be surprised to see uh, a black and white keyboard that is inverted. This was the norm at the time. And what you're looking at is, I believe, ebony. Um, some of this seemed to be stained wood, but the ebony keys, they're wearing out, they're dishing a bit, and they also have, uh, you know, no shading happening. And what you might take to be ivory on top of the uh, sharps is actually bone. If you, uh, here we have a nice close up of the keys. As you can see, they're made of ebony. These are also ebony. On the front, I believe, are dyed pear wood slips. And if we can get a close look at the top here. If I can get this thing to zoom in. There we go. And you can see that the uh, covers are actually bone, not ivory, so this is a guilt-free piano. But probably not for lack of wanting. Another little detail that I find really nice is the key slip here. This part here is notched to match the keys rather than having the keys be nipped off so that there's a nice straight line behind them as is mo as they are in modern so but yeah this isn't like anything you find on a modern piano One distinguishing feature of these Viennese pianos, as far as I can see, is that 
Well, everybody wants to put their name on the piano. Apparently somewhere in Vienna, there was somebody making these enameled cartouches. As you can see, it's, it is a, a nice baked enamel on there. It's very thin. You can rub it off in a heartbeat. It seems to be on a brass plaque. But this is pretty standard for this period. Today, they're just, you know, um, little... little appliques, or at best, you know, the inlaid brass. But this has this nice nameplate. I'm not sure when Innsbruck was called Innsberg. Maybe a linguist can help me with that one. Now, as I said, compared to a lot of forte pianos, um, this is pretty much a uh, straight lace case. There's not a lot of decorative elements to it. The one exception is the damper rail, which is what that piece of wood running side to side there is. Um, See if I can get one of them to move. There's the hammer coming up, but if you can see the uh, little bits moving inside the rail, those are the, uh, well, for lack of a better word, the popsicle sticks that the dampers are mounted to. Um, I'll take a closer look and explain that in a moment. It's a little hard to see from the front, but I really wanted to draw attention to this Nice little piece of marquetry that the maker took the time to include. Try and take a quick close-up of it. Okay, now up a little bit closer. And well, it's it's a nice piece of marquetry. It's not it's not particularly elaborate. But it's crisp, it's clean, and it even includes another strip of some exotic wood to set off the character of the uh, main case cover. I find it quite nice. And of course at the top you can see the tips of the uh, damper sticks. Take a quick look there now. Well, here are the dampers from the back. A little more visible. And they pretty much follow the norms for piano dampers until you start looking a little more closely at their construction. You see at this time dampers weren't made out of cut pieces of felt, especially down here in the dampers, down in the wedges. As you can see what you have is a piece of wood over which I believe a bit of buckskin has been rolled or wrapped to make your Your wedge. Up here, a more traditional non woven felt has been employed. And I need to look a little closer. There seems to be extra layers on some of them. But I can't uh, really get into that part of this yet because the only thing that holds that whole system together if I try and take it out is these little tabs on top and 
as you can see, they're far from complete and I would never get that back in their hole until I fix them. So I just can't open that one up yet. But as we saw, these are just sticks and they slip down through another little guide rail beneath that and the action key just pushes up on them and those are you know absolute direct descendants of the Jackson harpsichord and they were in the right place just make them do a different job. Dampers change soon thereafter, but you know, this is still 1810 or so. And of course, the biggest absence of all is the big cast iron plate. Those were not even thought of at this point. Truth be told, at this point, it was felt that the intrusion of metal into the construction of the piano would alter its tone in a metallic fashion. I will post a link to um, a piano, a reproduction that is of the same very close ilk, also an Anton Walter copy, playing some Beethoven, which was of the right time. And while I wouldn't call them metallic, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful kind of reedy, twangy tone. And I think if it got any more reedy, twangy, it might not be quite so nice. So maybe their fear was justified, but it was wrong. <laughs> but that still leaves the engineering question of how does this object hold all this tension. I believe there's somewhere between two and three tons of tension on this instrument. So that's, a, that's the equivalent of balancing a car in here. And hardly seems to be enough wood to do that. But what it is, is there is a heavy wooden strip right there that has all your hitch pins set into it and it runs down great lighting here but it runs down the entire length of the inner rim and holds all the ends of the strings now that's what's just what's happening above the surface. Below the surface, there are a lot of braces running side to side inside this box. Trying to keep those, those sides in place. down here at the far end that's actually a fairly large block of maple hidden inside there and it ideally holds the rest of that tension. 
Um, in another video, I'm going to go through all the things that are wrong with this piano and what I think I can do, if anything. And this part is, of course, of major concern. But beyond that, what you can see is it's just one long rank of thin wires and down at the lower end are brass wires because brass is denser and can ring out a better low pitch at those lengths than the iron was capable of. It just doesn't have the uh, elastic strength to be employed too much further up in the scale while all of this should be soft iron wire which is a good bit stronger than the brass but not very <laughs> which is why all the wires though they're very long are quite thin this piano relies on change in length a lot more than it relies on change in tension. And I look forward to doing a good study of the scale if I can pick it apart. And I suppose the, the last thing we should probably take a look at is the action. And let me pull that out and take a look at it. Well, here's the action out on the bench. And a quick glance between the model of the modern piano action and this um, shows that there's uh, very little in common between the two. Uh, they both have keys and they both have hammers. And after that, uh, everything gets twisted around a bit. Um, The other thing that is clearly different is the size of the hammers. Compare those two. But uh, we'll take a quicker look down here closer at the action. Because it's quite interesting in its own right. And here we are. A little close-up look at the action. And, and as in any piano action... Um, when you push down on the front of the key, the back of the key rises. And if I move to a different key here, maybe that one, you can see how in each key there's a little fork that has a hammer shank mounted directly to it. So the, the keys and the hammers are really a single mechanism in the Viennese action, which is what this is. I suppose I should have mentioned that. It's a, it's a Viennese action. These uh, developed until the, ooh, the early 20th century. Um, they fell out of favor as hammer masses grew, but as you can see, the action's fairly straightforward. There's a little tongue on the back of the shank that hooks this little lever, and as the key goes through the stroke, the uh, key naturally pulls the tip up from underneath a little restrainer there. And this isn't working quite perfectly, but it does escape. And this is not the oldest form of this type of action. This one has um, the newfangled development of its day 
the backstop rail. And if you watch carefully, see how the hammer catches it just a little bit before rest? Well, that gives the beak back here just a little bit of a, an advantage for getting back under the catcher as fast as the key might come up. So at its most nimble, this is a very quick, lively action. Um, I'll post a link to someone playing a modern reproduction of a piano very, very like this, and you'll see it's quite, quite musical, though in a distinctly different voice. I like it. I'm impressed with it. Um, I'm surprised that something like the, the Moonlight Sonata could have been written on something like this, but it was. So, take a quick look a bit closer at some of these components here, and uh, we'll get on to something else. Close up of the escapement action in operation. There's apparently a little lost motion. I don't know if that's supposed to be there or not. It might just be the leather being pounded in, but as you see, as the key goes through its stroke, you can see the leather being pulled forward, pulled forward, pulled forward. And it doesn't quite, doesn't quite escape if all I do is add pressure and don't force anything. If I just press through, so my suspicion is that this is positioned oh, just a little bit too far forward, and as is as are many of them. I think that's your main regulation option in this action, but you can see that really goes back under quite quickly. So the repetition will be quite good. Many things uh, left me speechless about this piano. But the one that got me first and kept me longest was the nature of the hammers. This is the lowest bass hammer on the piano. And as you can see, it is just a, you know, a rounded block of wood with a wrapping of two layers of thin buckskin and a layer of what might be chamois or some other type of uh, extremely soft leather and the shank look at the shank the shank is just a little whip this however was the standard size at the time and was significantly more um, mass being brought it brought to bear than uh, the pianofortes made just a little time before it. And this is all the more dramatic if you compare it to this. If I can get it to stand. <laughs> and that is the same hammer, an F hammer, off of a Steinway Concert Grand from 1878. So there's roughly 60 years of development between these 
these two items and if I were to go through all the other changes between 1815 and 1878 um, well it'd be a little bit like the you know the Wright brothers to Neil Armstrong it's hard to compare one to the other but um, this is still this is still a piano And in its day, this was the largest, most powerful concert grand available. And this was the fastest, most reliable action. Vini's actions are very good, very light and nimble, and very quick. if I said it before, but this is the type of instrument that uh, music like Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata was written on, so it's a very capable musical system. I've just never had one to look closely at, and I'm just amazed at uh, the economy of mass, shall we say. Okay, I couldn't leave the action um, without sharing with you the treble hammers. Yeah, the bass hammer left me gobstoppered. These leave me flabbergasted. <laughs> and again, they're, they're just trying to get I must be as little mass as they can to strike that string as hard as it can. Which wasn't the the theory for the rest of the evolution of the piano, but this is the way it was. <laughs> <laughs> 